the first of three panel discussions. We already had a luncheon as well today, exploring themes in the play as they relate to our contemporary society. This will take place about an hour, 15 minutes. The first half hour will be dedicated to questions with our special guests. And the second half hour will be a dialogue with you all where we can post questions with the audience and start our dialogue, which is so important. Catherine Randazzo is our literary manager. It's right here, down here. Um, the Literary and Managers and Dramatics Association of America is also following this program. And we are live tweeting. <laughs> as we speak. So if you see her on her cell phone, she's not calling her best friend. She's not bored. She's commenting or taking little video shots and streaming it throughout America. Also, I'd like to thank METV, who is here with Charles Clapsaddle as the director. And these will, the full panels will be on METV. And the next panel will be live streamed to the library associations. So we hope you sign up for those as well. That is called Sarasota Today. Well, without further ado, I'd like to bring up our panelists and introduce them to you. Would you come up, please? <laughs> we do have a full, their bios in the playbill, and I'd like to get started right away. So just briefly, I'm going to mention to my left is Mayor Shaw, who's also on our steering committee and has been instrumental in our uh, panel forums and the guidance of them. In the center is Dr. Moy, who's come from, where did you fly in from, Dr. Dallas Fort Worth. Dallas Fort Worth, who has this book, Freedom Flyers, the Oral Histories of the Tuskegee Airmen. And there was a luncheon today, and he'll be talking about their impact as well. And, and on my far left, Judge Charles Williams, who's just recently been elected as Chief Justice of the 12th Circuit Court. <laughs> Judge Williams is the chair uh, of the steering committee and has been uh, the formidable voice in developing our online forum, the questions, and the forum uh, program formats. He will be our guest moderator for all of the discussions. So Judge Williams, I want to start and turn this over to you to begin our line of questioning. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for uh, appearing today. And uh, this dialogue is for a dual purpose, uh, to educate and to also uh, entertain. So I want to make certain that we all take part in it. Uh, there will come a time when we can receive questions from the audience, and I encourage you to do so. We're going to stay on theme, uh, hopefully. Uh, and the theme for this panel is the Double V, World War II in Sarasota, uh, years 1941 through 1945. And I'm going to start with, uh, with Todd, the author of uh, Freedom Flyers, the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. And let's start with the origin of what's called the Double V campaign. What did it mean and what did it come to signify? Well, let me start by uh, thanking Florida Studio Theater and, and Bookstore One for bringing me here um, and for being such hospitable hosts. It's been a nice visit so far. Uh, the Double V campaign refers to uh, a campaign that was begun by the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the major black newspapers of the day uh, in the early 1940s when it was clear that the United States was going to enter World War II, uh, which had already been ongoing for a few years before Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Uh, they wanted to turn African Americans' service into World War II, in World War II into an opportunity for civil rights gains. And they came up with this slogan, the double V, victory over fascism abroad and victory over Jim Crow segregation at home. Uh, so it's a rather broad term that describes motivations that a lot of African Americans went into World War II with. We're gonna, we're gonna defeat Hitler's ideas abroad, and at the same time, we're going to defeat Jim Crow ideas here in the United States. If we could start, um, you know, what was the genesis of the Tuskegee Airmen? How did this idea develop? Blacks who watched what was going on in Europe, watched what was going on in Asia, and knew that the United States was going to get involved in this war, 
had, even before 1941, uh, been pushing for African-American in inclusion in the Army Air Corps. This was their precursor to the Air Force. It was a division of the Army. Uh, going back to the mid-1930s, the NAACP had been asking President Roosevelt to include African-Americans in flight training. They, it's, it's kind of hard to go back to the mindset in the 1930s, 1940s, but flight training was like uh, astronaut training and software development and uh, internet development all rolled up into one. It took, uh, well, and Olympic sports all rolled up into one. You had to be a great athlete, you had to be a quick thinker, you had to have mathematical abilities, all of these things to be a successful uh, military pilot. And the whites who ran the Army Air Corps didn't think African Americans had what it took uh, to do that and systematically excluded them from that. So it took a political campaign, it took a pressure campaign on the part of the Courier and the Chicago Defender and the NAACP pushing President Roosevelt, forcing him uh, to allow African Americans into pilot training. And rather than opening up the existing pilot training programs that were already out there for whites only, and saying anyone can, can enter these, uh, these training facilities, they were able to get this half a loaf measure, forcing him to create a training program only for African Americans. And they made that announcement in 1940. They created a, a program at Tuskegee Institute, what's now Tuskegee University, in central Alabama and uh, began training pilots in primary flight training at Moton Field at, at a Tuskegee Institute facility and began constructing Tuskegee Army Airfield which is a big uh, many thousand personnel filled uh, big Air Force base uh, adjacent to Tuskegee. Now obviously there were people who supported this project but there was a pushback <clears throat> Could you sort of explain to us what were the myths, what were the fears of some of the, say, white establishment military men uh, as it related to this experiment of having African-American pilots? Sure. The, uh, the, the generals who ran the Air Corps relied on a study that had come out of uh, the World War I era that purported to show scientifically, I mean, it's, it's not scientific by our terms, by any stretch, it's a quasi-scientific study that purported to show that African Americans did not have uh, reflexes equal to whites. They were afraid of the dark uh, as compared to whites. They did not have quick decision-making abilities that they would need. Uh, they didn't have leadership capability, these things. So they, they used that to justify these decisions, uh, keeping African Americans out of the Air Corps. So it, it really came down to the amount of political pressure that African Americans, who only made up 10% of the population, right? They're, they're a small minority group. How much pressure could they put on President Roosevelt? And uh, they had a friend in the White House at Eleanor Roosevelt. They had a, a real conduit to the president that way. How much, how much pressure could they bring to bear uh, to bring this about? So the, the, the white generals in the Air Corps and throughout the Army and throughout the War Department did not like this. They resented the fact that civilians were telling them what to do, how to organize their institution. Um, and they resented it. It's clear that they resented it. Uh, whites around Tuskegee resented it. They, they petitioned uh, trying to get the War Department to stop construction at Tuskegee Army Airfield, even though it brought in tens of millions of dollars a year in payroll and in construction and, and all of these things. But it was going to train African Americans to do something that they believed in their guts only whites could do, and it, it affected them psychologically that way. Uh, they also knew that there would be black officers there, and white people might have to salute black officers. They wanted to avoid that. So there's, there's no shortage of critics in the white community. There were critics in the African American community who said we should have integrated facilities across the board. You know, the, 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 the Tuskegee program is a bit of a compromise. Uh, it's a bit of a half a loaf measure. And so there were those, those critics, but once the, once the war started, that criticism in the African American community really went to the background and people rallied around the program. The, the, the program obviously survived politically, but what was it in terms of the military that convinced uh, the established military that this idea makes sense, this idea works, and these pilots are equal pilots to white pilots. Uh -huh. the, the, the political pressure had to stay on Roosevelt. They, uh, 
you know, once they got the training facility created and they, they had pilots being trained, uh, they had trained a cadre, they sat on their thumbs for months. Uh, they had to have national letter writing campaigns. Why can't our boys go off and fight for us? These sorts of things that were organized by NAACP chapters and black newspapers and uh, historically black college alumni associations, for instance. Why can't, you know, our boys are trained, they can do the job, why don't you give them a chance to do it? They had to keep the pressure on them. Uh, again, the, the, the whites who ran the Air Corps resisted that as much as they could. But the political pressure came to bear. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, was asking generals in the War Department, when are you gonna give these guys a chance? Uh, they, they finally were forced to do that. The, the Tuskegee trained pilots were sent to the North Africa campaign and aided the, uh, the North Africa invasion and then the push through North Africa up through Italy were then finally uh, stationed in Italy at a base called Ramatelli, where they most famously led the, uh, uh, the escort missions where the fighter planes that they flew escorted American bombers, all white crews, uh, into Nazi-held territory uh, as far away as Berlin. Uh, and at each step along the way, they had to not only prove that they could do it, but go above and beyond and force the generals in the Air Force to admit that they were doing as good a job. Uh, the, the numbers are clear. They did, uh, the, the old saw is that they had to be twice as good to be recognized as being equal. The reality is that they, they were slightly above average uh, by the statistics that the Air Force kept, the Air Corps, well, the, then the Army Air Forces. Uh, but if anyone had looked at this with a, with a clear mind and a clear conscience, they would have said, oh, these guys are just as good as anyone else. There's, there's no question about it. They did, in fact, earn a reputation among the white bomber crew members that, that they were better. Uh, the orders they got from their commander was that your job is not to go off and shoot down German planes and rack up uh, the swastikas on the, you know, painted on the front of your plane. Your job is to protect the bombers and to make sure that the 10 guys who go out on that mission in the bomber come home. And uh, some of the other white fighter groups, uh, according to the bomber crews, were more likely to go off on what were called happy hunting missions. Uh, so ironically, it was the, the guys and the segregated all white bomber crews who were sort of at the forefront in providing the recognition that they were just as good as, if not better, uh, than any of the other fighters in the American arsenal. One, one thing is that fact or fiction did Eleanor Roosevelt actually go up in a plane piloted by a Tuskegee Airmen? We hear that story over and over again that that actually occurred. She went up in a plane that was piloted by Chief Anderson who was the uh, chief civilian pilot trainer at Tuskegee Institute, uh, a pioneer in, in black aviation uh, who'd been at Tuskegee for several years before the war. So she was a trustee of the Rosenwald Schools Foundation, if you're familiar with those. Uh, and they had a, a meeting in, I guess it was 1939 or 1940 at Tuskegee Institute. She had heard about the civilian pilot training program that was, that was there at the Institute and uh, arranged for this publicity, you know, photo op uh, to, ha to have herself photographed in the, in the plane with Chief Anderson. She was an aviation enthusiast herself she had written articles encouraging parents to give their kids flying lessons before this. She loved to fly. And she also had a, a very popular nationally syndicated newspaper column. She wrote all about all the great work that was being done at Tuskegee uh, and polio research and, and all of these other things. And oh, by the way, there are these amazing men flying airplanes there. Uh, but yes, that's absolutely okay. true. Anderson was not a, a, a Tuskegee Airman himself, but he was the trainer in charge of, of their training program. We're going to move on to Mayor Shaw in a moment, but I, I want to ask this, this one last question. A and you touched on it in your lecture uh, earlier today. These pilots, uh, specifically speaking to the pilots, were exceptional after the war. And I wonder if you could share with the audience what made them so exceptional, what made them so special, and why were so many of them able to go on to have exceptional mm -hmm. professional careers after the war? To be accepted in pilot training, no matter what your ethnicity or race was in the United States uh, in the World War II era, you had to have graduated from college. At the beginning of the war, they then lessened the, the criteria. Uh, within a couple of years, you had to have at least two years of college to get accepted. And then by the end of the war, you had to pass an equivalency exam to get accepted into pilot training. So that was the case for anyone. And, and the criteria, criteria were the same for African Americans. 
The difference is that fewer than 1% of African Americans had been to college in 1940. So the people who could get over that first bar uh, for, for pilot training were the absolute cream of the crop in the African American community. They came from all walks of life. Uh, you know, some of them had been Ivy League scholarship recipients. Uh, the vast majority of them came from families that had to really scrimp and save, and this is in, in the midst of the Great Depression, right, that they had been able to go to college. They worked their way through school. Uh, most of them from uh, historically black colleges like Hampton and Howard and Morehouse and Alabama State. Um, but they came from uh, literally every state, uh, every walk of life. What they held in common was this drive and um, it, it, they were exceptional by, by any definition you would come up with. So those were the people who made it into the program in the first place. It would stand to reason that after the war they continued to be exceptional. Uh, during the war they really cultivated this, this atmosphere in Tuskegee of uh, just really high expectations for each other and, and for themselves. So I think it stands to reason that after the war they would go on to do uh, exceptional things. Some of them were civil rights leaders, many of them were corporate leaders, many of them were entrepreneurs, uh, doctors, lawyers, professors, you name it. Uh, it's hard to generalize about them because they came from so many walks of life, but that's a generalization right. that I'm very comfortable in making, that, that they remained exceptional after the war and whatever. And sadly though, uh, they weren't able to be professional pilots yeah. outside the military. It's true. Yeah, the, the, so many of them uh, had dreamed of, of being pilots as kids, as, as all American kids did in the 1930s. Kids were just obsessed with Charles Lindbergh and, and the other aviation pioneers of the day and wanted to grow up to be like these guys. And uh, the difference is that there, were, uh, there just were not opportunities before the war for, for African American aviators. There were I think fewer than 100 licensed uh, aviators, African American aviators in the United States by 1939, 1940. Uh, interestingly enough, Dale White Sr., uh, the father of Dale White Jr., who just introduced himself to me uh, before the program started, was one of those. He and another pilot named Chauncey Spencer made uh, uh, a barnstorming trip from Chicago to Washington, D.C. in an old jalopy of a biplane in order to gin up publicity for blacks in aviation in, uh, what was that, 1938, 1939, uh, and helped lead to the, uh, the legislation that opened up opportunities for blacks on a larger scale in the first place. Um, the kids who dreamed of becoming pilots, African American kids, realistically didn't have that opportunity available to them. And they hoped that the service they provided during the war would open up those doors, would kick them wide open for themselves and for everyone else. But sadly, this is an instance in which the door shut just as immediately as it had opened uh, after the war. Uh, I only know of, of one of the Tuskegee trained pilots who had a career with a civilian airline, and that was as an executive. I know of one Tuskegee airman, uh, Tuskegee trained mechanic who had a career with one of the major air carriers as a mechanic. Uh, the rest who dreamed of being pilots, uh, who were able to, to make that career, had to make it within the military. Uh, the civilian world was, was much slower uh, to catch on to this than the military was. We think of the military as being a very conservative, hidebound, tradition-bound institution. And, you know, a lot of times it is in a lot of circumstances. But in this circumstance, it was far ahead of the rest of the United States. I'd like to, at this point, move into uh, Sarasota during this time, and, and I'm going to start, uh, Mayor Shaw, with the idea of the Double V uh, campaign as defined by the airmen, but I, I want to preface uh, my question with more of a philosophical, uh, moral question before we go into the specifics. As a veteran yourself and, and someone who knows and has known local veterans, who have fought in various wars from World War II onward. And I take special note of an article in today's uh, Sarasota Herald that mentions uh, in 1964, uh, Booker High School graduate Michael Campbell, uh, an African American who was the first Sarasotan killed in action uh, in Vietnam. Describe yourself this dichotomy of being a patriot and loving your country 
and having to also fight a war back at home? Let me just say that uh, patriotism has been a part of my family all along. Cousin Jerry Hempfield left here and went to the Spanish-American War from Tampa and Lakeland. Um, World War I, I had my Uncle Henry Limerick or Henry Small. Uh, World War II, I had my dad and cousins who um, went to war. And so it, it, it had been um, a part of me. I, I totally uh, took it as a part of what I was supposed to do, to wear the uniform, to give what was necessary, uh, to be the American. Um, I didn't really get into uh, the color. I was a big fan of Sergeant Rock and the DC Comics. We had a pepper tree outside my mom's kitchen and I was a B-17 wing gunner. I was a tail gunner. The higher up I went in the tree, I would be an airborne. So, you know, okay. I, it's, all, it's always been a part of me. If you could paint a flavor or picture of Sarasota, what would it have looked like during the war years in 1940, 41 through 45? What, what can you tell this audience about what Sarasota would have been like during the war years? Well, Sarasota was, uh, the Sarasota Braden Airport, as you know it today, was the Sarasota Air Base, where we had stationed here a number of African Americans, so many that we would uh, create our own USO um, through challenges and times uh, requesting such a service uh, facility for the, for the men. And a number of the persons living here, my aunts and some others, would participate in the dances that took place. And uh, this was located down at um, 1934, 34th Street here in Sarasota. Okay, this was called the Colored Servicemen's Club. It was. And, it was it, and where would it, so that we have an idea, where would it be located? Today it would be in the area of the Robert Taylor uh, multi-activity complex that we have. Uh, it was a green wooden building with a wooden floor, with a fireplace, and um, that's where you learn to do the mashed potatoes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 1941 through 45, where would African Americans in this community be limited in terms of where they could live and where they could shop? Uh, very, very much so. Uh, Newtown, or the Overtown area, as we, we call it, from um, 5th Street uh, to 9th, uh, was, uh, and I, I, I I have to say 4th Street because the Thomases and uh, Richard Elam and those lived in that area. Um, through 9th, it was shopping areas. Uh, along what is today MLK, it was known as 33rd at that time. Uh, we had a number of uh, cafes uh, that the servicemen would uh, come and congregate. Um, the Bush House was the uh, first um, service uh, organization that we had here for the um, colored uh, mechanics and servicemen at okay. the time. And an, an unusual number of Tuskegee Airmen uh, eventually uh, retired to Sarasota. Uh, first of all, do you, do you happen to know why that was and, and, and what stories or what uh, do you know about that circumstance? I, I, I would have to think that it would go back to a black realtor at that time, Peggy Harrison, Harris, who brought a, a number of uh, retirees to this area, the Meadows and other areas here, and word started uh, to travel amongst the persons who were retiring from up north to this area. And um, Colonel Hurd, Nasby Wynn, um, the Russes, there were a number of these people who came as Tuskegee Airmen and the ground crews that were with them that retired here. Okay, did you have any follow up? Well, I have a, actually a question really for both of you gentlemen. And 
um, in our city, we have two, uh, we have three uh, men with the Tuskegee were, that were in the, trained at Tuskegee, one who was a pilot, uh, Mr. Hardy. And they came and talked with the cast. And there was a theme in it that I'd like to open up with you both that I also saw in your book very clearly. And it relates to the double V and a real acute sense of awareness of purpose. And Mr. West grew up in the South. So when he got on the train to go to Tuskegee, all of the, set, the Jim Crow laws and the segregation was kind of normal, as he said. And I'm paraphrasing. It wasn't shocking. He'd grown accustomed to how he had to behave, how he had to walk, what car to sit in. And then Mr. Hardy, who'd come from a much more cosmopolitan city that was int more integrated, more integrated experiences, it was a slow shock coming through the trains, getting down to Tuskegee. And one of your opening stories is that, of being in the wrong place on the car, and how frightening it was, and how he had to start internalizing this awareness of the Jim Crow. And I asked if they shared it among themselves, or they talked about it among themselves, because it was shocking, as Mr. Hardy said. Could you? either elaborate on any of that? Sure. Uh, Kate is, is referencing one of the oral histories that I drew on from the Tuskegee Airmen Oral History Project that was sponsored by the National Park Service uh, and that you can listen to and use at the National Historic Site at Moton Field in, in Tuskegee today. Um, and, and that body of work uh, forms the basis of the book I've written, Freedom Flyers. Uh, so the particular story that, that Kate's talking about comes from John Roach, uh, a gentleman who grew up in Boston and had never traveled to the South before. He was stationed, you know, uh, uh, told that he was being sent to Tuskegee. Uh, and got on the train, everything was normal, got to Washington, D.C. and was told, you need to get out of this car. You are, you are not allowed to, to sit on this car, even though Uncle Sam has paid for a berth in, uh, in the Pullman car. Uh, you have to sit on the Jim Crow car, which is the dirtiest, rickettiest uh, car right behind the, the engine so that all the cinders from the coal-fired engine blow back into the car. It's a nasty place. Uh, so he, he had that experience as he's preparing himself mentally to perhaps go out and risk his life for his country, which is a really interesting way uh, of, of having that realization. And it happened to him in Washington, D.C., which was very much a southern city in the early 1940s and was, was as segregated as Mississippi in some ways. Uh, so as they're pulling out of Union Station in Washington, D.C., he looks out the window and he can see the United States Capitol and says, I wonder if those guys know what's going on here. They, they, they did. They knew what was going on there. So many of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, came from outside of the segregated South and had exactly that experience. One of them claimed, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's a good enough story to repeat it, that when he got to, I believe it was Aiken, South Carolina, uh, he had to go to the restroom and he looked up and there was one door marked white, W-I-T-E, and there was one door marked colored, C-U-L-L-U-D. And he said to, <laughs> His, his interviewer for the Oral History Project said, I thought I was in a loony bin as soon as I got to the South and I couldn't wait to get out. But for, for the men who had grown up in the North and gone to school in the North and were used to being around other educated people and uh, had different value systems from, from those of the South, that was a very rude awakening and they, and they absolutely did talk about it. Some of them figured out how to make it work to their advantage. Uh, African Americans who traveled on the trains couldn't necessarily expect to be served on the dining cars, so they brought food with them. And I remember uh, Roy Chappelle from, from Chicago telling one of our interviewers, you know, my buddy and I would get on those trains and we would look for the sisters with the, with the shoebox. That's it. Because they, carried, they, they made their meals and carried them in shoeboxes. And they, he said, yeah, we made sure to find the sister who had a pound cake in her shoebox and we, <laughs> you know, we looked as hungry as we possibly could and she fed us. And we liked it, and that was good food. Um, so, you know, within that world, within the limitations that were placed on them, 
you could build community and to an extent you could you could make it work to your advantage and you could um, uh, I think the community that builds up w within that atmosphere is what's important about it it's limited mm -hmm. it's you know the opportunities are not equal uh, but there's there is uh, there's a camaraderie that develops. I like what you said this afternoon. If you could both paint a picture for us, because you said it was a culture of expectation and excellence in a world that said no, mm -hmm. and I thought that was great. If you could maybe paint what that means for us. It's cert it's it's hard for white people and and it's hard for people of my generation of of any ethnic group to understand how people who were denied the right to vote. Uh, told they weren't good enough to use the public library, weren't good enough to use the dining car on the train, whatever the case was, the, you know, whatever the limitation was that Jim Crow placed on them, it's hard for us to understand why people who were treated that way would go out and fight for a country that was treating them that way, right? The, you know, the, the United States allowed Jim Crow to exist. Why would they do that? And so, we asked Tuskegee Airmen exactly that question in, in, in our interviews in the early 2000s, and I think for the most part, they just were flabbergasted that anyone would ask him that question. Well, my country was in trouble. I, of, of course I'm gonna go out and fight for my country. I'm not gonna wait for my country to change. I'm not gonna wait for Congress to pass laws that enforce the 14th Amendment. I, you know, it might be several years. My country's in trouble in 1941. I have to go out and, and fight for it. And um, for those of us who, who take that for granted, you know, the United States works okay for me as a, as a 44 year old white guy. Uh, I, I, I take those things for granted and uh, other people of my generation take those things for granted. It's hard to understand how you could go out and risk your life for, for a country that would do that. But they, they didn't give that a second thought. I think almost to a man. Lots of them will tell you, I went out and I did it, I, I wanted to do this for my race, and I wanted to prove that we could do this and open up opportunities for other people in my race. But almost to an individual, they, they, even those who didn't say that would say, listen, my country was in trouble, I'm an American as much as anyone else is, and it was my duty. We bring full circle to you, Mayor Shaw, because that's how you open, saying my patriotism. Surely, uh, let's go back for a moment to the trains and thank A. Philip Randolph, who was the organizer of the Pullman Porters and, and, and black folk gravitated towards the Pullman mm -hmm. Porters. The porters on the train uh, made that story that you um, brought forth uh, a bit easier as time went on mm -hmm. because they were always there. They were always uh, available. And, and they did what they were supposed to do in protecting uh, those incidents so that they didn't have um, stories of not being able to have the windows open or having to have the shades pulled down when you went through certain areas were, were, were true. Another one, of course, everybody going north took a shoebox when you didn't have the money to afford eating in the uh, 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 dining area many times. So everybody leaving here, I, I, I can readily remember the shoebox mm -hmm. stories and seeing cousins get on the train going to New York, uh, other places carrying a shoebox. Um, the expectations. It was understood that you had to be better than your competitor just to make it. Um, we were taught that the man who wrote the book got an A, the teacher who studied the book got a B, you studied under me, you got a C. You, that expectation level, you, you had to rise and it was expected of you to be exceptional and so. Did your father and uncles and, and people of that generation talk about that contradiction of going off to fight for a country that segregated them? Definitely. Um, my dad was a survivor of 
the Battle of the Bulge. He drove the Red Ball Express. They were the persons that took the fuel and ammo and personnel to the front for Patton's Third Army. And many times um, there were conflicts mm -hmm. between who they were and what they were doing and who they were hauling at the same time. Um, his story was always that Patton required them to dress to die. They, they, they had to dress in their class A's and, and their so. Definitely, um, th we had uh, Michael Jesse Hardy was a, an MP and his stories are different. Uh, they couldn't um, bother white servicemen, you know. His was, you patrol the colors and that's what you do. So, yeah, they, they, t they told of those stories mm -hmm. and their stories are different. My mom and dad uh, were at Camp Shelby in Mississippi and they tell of both sleeping on a small cot at that time because they weren't able to uh, get any other accommodation. Mm -hmm. So, definitely. You talk, and, and I want to move to the audience questions right after this, but you talk about some of the byproducts that forced segregation. And I know uh, Mr. Hardy told the cast this, and I don't know if you could help me with this if you were there, but um, when they would have to go to a segregated town, the rest of their units, the whites, were all cramped in like sardines in their tents. And they had to segregate the African-American officers. So they ended up finding a, like a big airplane hangar that was really nice, <laughs> that had like tables and beautiful like beds and that uh, very slowly all of the other officers, the whites who were sleeping like sardines, got so upset and started creeping over to play cards at night. And it ended up a real byproduct that forced a segregation mm -hmm. that the army was keeping desegregated and he said it, it walls were coming down in those kind of situations you mentioned a few of those in the book if you can mention one and then we'll move to audience questions they came down in combat situations uh, they uh, the as I mentioned the the members of the all-white bomber crews were the first men in the Air Force to say look these guys know what they're doing and we want to give them more opportunities because when they fly next to us we come home and we like that um, so <laughs> keep assigning them to us um, that's that's true that happened um, there were there were instances in which uh, I w we spoke to members of one bomber crew that had to make uh, an emergency landing at Ramatelli, the Tuskegee Airmen's base in Italy. Uh, they, they landed at the base. It wasn't on their maps. They were coming back from a mission where their plane was crippled, and they had no idea what to expect, but they landed there and um, saw the red tails, saw the, you know, the distinctive planes that the Tuskegee trained pilots flew, said, oh, these are the guys who've been up in the air. They've been doing such a good job. We're in good hands. At least we know we're at an American base. Uh, this is great. But who are all these black guys? <laughs> because they literally did not know that there were African Americans being trained as pilots and, and didn't know the guys who had been flying uh, the red tails alongside them weren't, were African Americans. And um, most, so we interviewed three or four members of that, of that crew. Most of them loved it. And the time they spent at Ramatelli was the time of their life. And, and they said these guys had just figured out how to live better than we had at our base. They had, you know, they had jury rigged heaters that, they, that worked better. It was, it was really cold in Italy in December. They, they had um, uh, amateur hour at the, at the base club. And they, so they entertained each other. And you know, whereas we would just go off and do whatever in our tents. So there was, there was more of that togetherness. Uh, one member of their crew whom we did not interview because he had died already was a native Alabamian who decided he was not going to sleep in no nigger bed according to the, the oral histories uh, that we heard and, and went out and slept in his plane for the first two nights uh, but it was so cold out there that he decided <laughs> you know oh, the, well. the tent was not so bad after all and, um, and so did, did go and sleep in the tent that sounds like a, a, a nice story, but 
uh, I told a version of it earlier this afternoon, the follow-up to it is that one of the Tuskegee Airmen was in charge of censoring the mail that went home. And so he had to read the mail that the white crew members wrote home to make sure they weren't giving away secrets about the location of the base or anything like that. And so he read this guy's letter back to his wife and it said, you know, dear honey, I hope you'll take me back. I had to sleep in a nigger bed at a nigger base with all these niggers. And uh, after they had shown him so much hospitality over the week, had, had fixed his plane for him so they could get back to their base, all that sort of stuff. I hope everyone will excuse my English. That's, that's the word he used in the 1940s. Um, and so lots of times the people who had those experiences had their minds changed. Lots of times they went back home with the same attitudes they had left with. And uh, there, there was no magic wand in World War II. It did change a lot of attitudes. And it did send a lot of people home um, convinced that African Americans could do anything that whites could do. Uh, but, but many more of them went home determined not to change anymore and, and to go back to exactly the way things had been before the war. I would uh, like to open it up to audience questions. And if we will repeat each question so everybody hears it. And if you try to make your question succinct, Catherine will uh, come around and repeat the question. Okay, right in the third row, I think, fourth row there, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Let's get that one first, okay? Th that's good. Todd, you want to repeat that? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, what were the connections between the airmen who trained at Tuskegee and women who trained as WASPs in the Women's Air Service Pilots Program, I guess it was called? Uh, African American women were not accepted into that program. So there, uh, there may be one or two exceptions to this, but by and large, there were not black WASPs. So there, there was no connection on that level. Uh, the Army made pretty sure to keep African-American men away from white women. So to my knowledge, uh, the, the WASPs had the job of ferrying uh, airplanes from base to base as they were needed throughout the United States. So I don't know of any instances in which WASPs uh, flew planes to Tuskegee. There may have been some, but I don't know of any. Not that I'm aware of, because they had separate power bases that were pushing for their inclusion in the first place. Let's get another question, and then we'll come back for your second, if that would be okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, right there. Mm -hmm. Hi. Were African Americans the only minority that were not allowed into the main training programs, or were other minorities also excluded, and did anything happen for them, or did they just stay out of it completely? I'm thinking of Native Americans, Indians, Asians. Mm -hmm. you're, you're speaking of the Marine Corps specifically? My, um, uh, I, I know less about what happened in the Marine Corps than I do about the Army Air Corps, but um, there, there was a group of African Americans, the first Marine Corps, uh, blacks in the Marine Corps known as the Montford Point Marines, a very small number, fewer than 10, I think, uh, who, who became Marine Corps officers. Uh, there were, of course, the Navajo Code Talkers, and um, there were any number of Hispanic Marines as well during World War II. Sorry, but really I was referring to pilot training. Okay. There were, um, I know of a few examples of Hispanics being uh, accepted into the existing pilot training programs. Um, so yes, the, some Mexican Americans and other Hispanic Americans did serve as, as pilots during World War II. Uh, the Tuskegee program accepted um, a few people of color from allied nations. Uh, for instance, Haiti sent a, a few people to Tuskegee to learn how to fly. Uh, I'm not aware of Asian Americans or, or Native Americans uh, entering any of these programs, but if they did, they, they entered programs other than Tuskegee's. So the comment is that uh, 
the woman's husband was a, uh, trained as a B-29 pilot uh, initially, but many Jewish men like himself were washed out of pilot training because the Air Corps did not want uh, Jewish pilots flying bombers for what reason? They didn't want them flying with a group. Okay, so that, so that non-Jews would have to take their orders. And uh, since they didn't want that situation, so many of them went into fighter pilot training and flew fighters during the war. I'm not at all surprised to hear that. Um, the, the discrimination in that case would have been less systematic, uh, but no less real, I suspect. Um, uh, so, so they were not uh, kept out of training as systematically as African Americans were at the beginning of the war, but I don't doubt for a second. The, the Air Corps, uh, the, the officer uh, cadre that was, that was there and was in charge of the service at the beginning of World War II uh, was overwhelmingly Southern, uh, entirely white, very hierarchical, uh, and, and came with all of the attitudes that you expect from, from people with that background. And so that story would not surprise me in the least. The question is, uh, did this breakthrough in the Army Air Corps spill over into larger breakthroughs for African Americans and, and members of other minority groups and other branches of the service like the Navy? Uh, on a very small scale, yes. Um, so that there were naval officers trained for the first time in World War II. They're called the Golden Thirteen. Uh, the, the handful of African Americans in the Marines, I know less about the Coast Guard, and, and um, there were greater opportunities for African Americans in the Army, in the infantry especially. Um, but African Americans chose pilot training in the first place as kind of the point of the spear, uh, or the camel's nose that they wanted to get in the tent in the first place, choose your metaphor, uh, because it was considered the most uh, intellectually taxing of the, of the branches of service. And if you could prove that you could do that, then you could prove that you could do everything. So that helps to explain why they made such a big deal out of it politically before the war. Catherine in the back there, where you are. Mm -hmm. Prior to the entrance of the United States in World War II, this was a training base for the Royal Air Force of the United Kingdom. Was there any interaction with the Black Sewer Station here with the Royal Air Force? Mayor Shaw would know much more about that than I would. <laughs> uh, he's speaking of Tuskegee, am I correct? Uh, no, I think he's talking about... Oh, yeah. here in Sarasota. The, 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 um, the Royal uh, um, component was in Arcadia. That's where the number of... The, the cemetery is for the persons who was lost in training. They were in a, 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 an airfield in Arcadia. Um, here, we had uh, P-51s and P-40s that flew from in Sarasota, but I don't know of any interaction. Um, I can tell you that we used to have what was Hudson Bayou for the officers here. It's where today we have the Whitaker Park, uh, Florisota Gardens, which is uh, off of uh, Wood Street and uh, 301 Washington Boulevard for the offices uh, that lived in this area. But I don't know of any interaction uh, between them at that time. How was the command structure set up, the Tuskegee Airmen, and how did the officers then relate back to the, the rest of the Air Corps? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. The, the top cadre of officers at Tuskegee were white. And the, uh, and that, the, the base commander uh, uh, throughout the war was white. The expectation was that as uh, men were trained and then went off and served, they would then come back as trainers, uh, training officers there at Tuskegee, and they would replace the whites who started out, uh, you know, at the beginning of the war, the only people who knew how to fly were white, so the only people who could train people to fly were white. Um, that, so by the end of the war, um, there was a very small cadre of white officers and effectively an all-black city. You know, there were, the Tuskegee Army Airfield at its height had, you know, four or 5,000 employees. 
or, or people stationed there. And nearly everyone was, was black at that point. So they did everything on the base. They made you know, all of the logistical decisions they had to make. Um, uh, did all of the training. Uh, the dentists and the doctors were black. The nurses were black. So it was a small, high-functioning black city. And it was very important as an example for that reason. They, they, they proved during the war that they could do all of these things in addition to flying airplanes. And their champion was that white commanding officer, Noel F. Parrish. And I'm, I, I make a point of making sure that everyone knows that Noel F. Parrish was a liberal white guy from Texas because they really exist. There are, there are, <laughs> there are white guys from Texas who have a, a, a head on their shoulders and can... <laughs> Um, if I say anything more, I'm going to get in trouble in Texas. But um, he he championed them, and he was he was chosen for the first Air Command Staff College class. Uh, you know the colonels who were being groomed to become generals, and wrote his thesis on why the Air Force needed to desegregate, and and you know proved that it was uh, he recognized that it was morally wrong, but his argument was that it was economically foolish to organized the Air Force this way. And because of that, uh, because of his championing uh, uh, of desegregation in the Air Force, once Truman signed the executive order desegregating the armed forces, the Air Force was the first to say, listen, we're ready. We, we have a plan to do this. And, uh, and the Tuskegee Airmen across the board to an individual revered Colonel Parrish and had great things to say about him in our oral history interviews. My understanding, there were about a thousand Tuskegee pilots trained. That's in correct. World War. Uh, can you tell us something about the casualty numbers or rates for those pilots? Number one, and secondly, uh, did the Tus Tuskegee Airmen ever receive the acknowledgement from the government or uh, from uh, our citizens uh, for their uh, service in the war effort? The, the answer to that first question is 400 and some of those, I believe it's 400 and some of those 1,000 served overseas in combat. Uh, the Tuskegee program also trained a, a bomber group that never served overseas, largely for um, race relations reasons that we can get into in a minute if you'd like mm -hmm. to. I don't have, I believe 66 were killed in, in action. I may have that number wrong. Um, but the, the numbers were similar to other fighter groups of their size during the war. The 332nd fighter group did win the Distinguished Flying Cross, and uh, the Tuskegee Airmen as a whole did eventually win national recognition by all sorts of definitions, including the Congressional Gold Medal. Um, but it took years and years, and it took organizing on the, on the behalf of the Tuskegee Airmen, who uh, formed an alumni group in the early 1970s simply because they felt like they had not been recognized and they wanted to be recognized and they wanted to teach the rest of the country uh, about what they had done. So they formed Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated in the early 1970s and set up speakers bureaus and uh, you know any elementary school that wanted to bring in a Tuskegee Airmen had access to one so they would come in and talk to kids. And so that's been going on for nearly 50 years now. And, and so the rest of the country has, I think to a large extent, caught up to uh, what they did during the war. Thanks in large part to popular culture, thanks to productions like Fly, uh, thanks to the George Lucas movie for all its faults, uh, which has uh, at least exposed a new generation of, of Americans, especially kids, uh, to what they did during World War II. So I think that notice has come around. Of course, there's, there's still a long way to go and I'm sure if, if Mr. Hardy or any of the other Tuskegee Airmen were here, they would say, uh, yeah, we're being recognized, but, but we feel like we haven't quite gotten our due yet, if I can speak for them. Five years after World War II ended, the Korean War started. Could you discuss with the audience the transition, if any, what happened to the Tuskegee group? The, um, the, the men who'd been trained at Tuskegee who remained in the force were all stationed at Lockburn Air Base outside of Columbus, Ohio until 1949 when the Air Force began to desegregate. And they remembered that in very bittersweet terms. They, they liked having that cadre 
uh, they knew who they could count on and what this other guy flew like and what his tendencies were and uh, and they had a good time together and they and they trusted each other and they were very close so that's that's the good part, the bad part was that there was no way to advance in a unit like that because there's only one general and there are only so many colonels. And um, so when they had, w when the Air Force desegregated, that unit was broken up and sent to the four winds. That was a year before Korea, right? So the, the men who stayed in the Air Force through that conflict were, for the most part, the only African Americans and otherwise all white groups. They had a variety of experiences. Some of them would tell you I was treated just like anyone else. Uh, many others would tell you that I did have to be twice as good. I still had to be twice as good just as I, as I did in World War II and I never got the recognition I deserved and I didn't get the promotions I deserved. Um, but the, the, the record there was much more mixed than it had been during the war. I'd like to wind down with a question for each panelist, and you as well, Judge Williams. And starting with Mayor Shaw, we talked about this being um, the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen on the civil rights. What is that legacy to you personally, is my question. What inspires you personally about this story? One, knowing many of the individuals who came to Sarasota in retirement, their story, uh, participating in uh, honoring them here in Sarasota during Veterans Day services, uh, I want to say around 2008, we had a uh, big ceremony here in Sarasota for the Tuskegee Airmen and the Redcoats as they came through, the mechanics and crews that lived here at that time. So it, it, to, for me, it was everything. It was everything that I had looked up to, still do. Uh, I think I may have told you the other night while being in the play, I heard this great commentary running behind me and uh, couldn't imagine somebody knowing that much about the Tuskegee Airmen until the lights went on and the voices, hi Mayor, George Hardy. <laughs> so, you know. It, it, it's it's uh, it's it's truly a, to be a part of this story is an amazing thing and it's lifelong. I'll I'll share it forever and um, as long as I can. Thank you, Dr. Moy. I'll I'll talk about a very selfish uh, thing that I draw from this. I grew up in Sandy Springs, Georgia in uh, you know in the public schools in the 1970s and 1980s which were integrated uh, because of the sacrifices that that these guys made and the movement that they made possible they weren't the civil rights movement as a whole themselves right it, it took lots of other people after World War II and lots of different kinds of organizing strategies uh, to make all of that happen but I see World War II as the starting point for that and I see this particular campaign as the most important of the campaigns during World War II that made the civil rights movement possible. So the civil rights movement made a big difference in my life and, and improved my life and I got a better education as a result of it. And um, a lot of other people did as well, not just me. Uh, a lot of other people did as well, so it's not, not purely a selfish um, uh, motive there. Um, being able to, to work on this project with the National Park Service and to meet so many of the Tuskegee Airmen was, was truly the, the honor of a lifetime. And on top of having the great stories and uh, you know, just uh, being allowed to hang around with them, they're really fun guys. <laughs> and they tell dirty jokes and they, you know, they like to have a drink and, and they were just really fun to be around uh, on, on top of everything else. So I'll, I'll, I'll cherish this association I've, I've had with them in a small way for as long as I live. Thank you. Judge Williams. You know, I, I, I am, um, I know we're talking about the Tuskegee Airmen, but I, I want all of you, if, if you have not had a chance to go to the local section of the Sarasota Herald and look at the photograph of, of Michael Campbell. I'm, I'm haunted by that photograph for some reason, and, and there was a story about him uh, several months ago, and I read that story, and he was an all-American boy. 
growing up here in Sarasota. And the reason I'm haunted by him is that he died in October 1964, killed in action, uh, volunteered to go to Vietnam. And we know in 1964, he probably would not have been welcome uh, in most of the stores here in, in downtown Sarasota. He probably uh, only experienced a segregated education. But when you look at that photograph, you feel an extreme amount of patriotism. And when you see this play fly, you come out with an extreme amount of patriotism. And so when people question uh, whether or not African Americans love this country, that photograph of Michael Campbell says it all. And I think the legacy of the Freedom Flyers say it all. And so that's what I take away from it, is just an extreme sense of pride uh, and patriotism. Can I? May I? I? I have to tell you, Mike and I grew up together. We went to church together. His brother and I were classmates. I don't think there was a more uh, shocking day for Booker High School and the students at that time because the class of 64, most of them went to uh, Vietnam. It was just getting, but the day we got the story, got the news of Michael, was probably the most uh, rude awakening to this happening. Um, if you were to come to the statue as you enter Fred uh, Hammond's Park, you will see Mike's name there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I knew Ken Golden's son, who was the next, and he was white. Uh, who we lost at the same time, right right after that. So you start looking back over this and, and, and you look at that, that monument, I can look at uh, J.B. Gibson and J.B. Gibson Jr., the father dying in World War II and the son dying in Vietnam. So when we look at Mike and, and those guys that went, Mike was only there 34 days when uh, his incident took place and um, just about three and a half years ago, his younger brother, Raph, was coming from uh, Bay Pines, and one of the persons in the uh, facility with Raph uh, asked Raph, where are you from? He said, Sarasota. He said, oh, yeah, man, one of my partners got hit in Vietnam and told the story, and he was there when Mike got it. So it's a Michael's story. What you see in that picture is felt throughout uh, my generation, especially those of us who knew him. I think the military has been remarkable that way because if you look at any newspaper on any day, you can see um, people in the military coming home. They're wearing the same gear. They can be different colors, different classes, different educational, backgrounds, it doesn't matter, you don't know. They're all wearing the same gear and their arms are open to their loved ones. And the same iconic picture is being displayed on the New York Times as well as the Tuskegee paper, as well as Atlanta, where, as well as in California. And I always find that quite moving because there is no separation there. I think in closing, uh, the patriotism in the play, Judge, is so correct. It's a stirring play for that, for those I think you would agree who have seen it. And there's a quote in the play that I want to end with, and it says, we are all in this river of history. And just as World War II, many of us who study it cannot wrap our minds around it. We can't wrap our minds around the shocking details of the Holocaust. We can't wrap our minds around so many aspects, but by bringing these specific aspects forward, we can finally understand this river that we're all in together, unseparate and flowing forward. So this is the first of those panels in the river of our shared history. I want to thank my guests, 
Thank you so much for coming in. It was a great luncheon today and this afternoon. His book is still, we only have 11 copies left. Uh, flew out today. They're signed and they're at uh, the bar if anybody would like to pick up one. Mayor Shaw, thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing. Thank in you. In the city, on our panels and forward. And Judge Williams, Chief Justice, it's uh, formidable having you as part of Florida Studio Theater's voice. Thank you. Thank you. We will see you, our next one, I think is Catherine, is February 11th for Sarasota. Oh, no. 22nd. When is it? 26th. 26th. Catherine Randazzo is managing the forums. Thank you so much. Sarasota today with our public defender, Lawrence Eager, the Honorable Lawrence Eager, who's quite wild up here. Uh, someone from the sheriff's office. So we know that things are happening around the country, little hotbeds, and we want to talk about what's going on in Sarasota. So we hope to see you there for that. We'll see you at FLY, and we'll see you throughout the forums. Get on our blog. It's in the program. And please continue the discussion. There are so many people, really great people on that blog. So we hope to see you writing for that as well. Thank you. We'll see you at the theater.